welcome back to media watch and this is anchi quadra balibai live now through our internet call via skype is our guest from the unesco jakarta office dr ming kok lim the advisor for communication and information of unesco jakarta good afternoon dr ming good afternoon angie thank you very much for having me thank you very much and we can actually see you on video right now although you don't see us Hi. say hello thank you very much hello as promised uh, dr ming is joining us live from jakarta via internet patch oh by the way dr ming miss uh annie sarila is saying hello and uh he's Hi, sending annie. her greetings to you all right um Dr. Lim leads his team at UNESCO, which supports capacity building for journalists, uh, advises on media policy and expanding journalism curricula to reflect the new sustainable development goal. Dr. Lim has been involved in the global campaign to strengthen and raise awareness on freedom of expression, press freedom, safety of journalists, and the issue of impunity for crimes against journalists. Welcome back to Green FM, Dr. Ming Kok Lim, because you were here before in September. Yes, thank you very much for having me again. Yes, it's our pleasure and our honor to actually have you here. Um, November 2, you know, passed and uh, UNESCO had this campaign, My Fight Against Impunity, on the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. Have you uh, done an assessment of the uh, whether the campaign actually reached your mission or your goals? Well, um, thank you very much for mentioning the, the campaign. And uh, the campaign is actually ongoing uh, by the fact that we are still having this discussion right now. Uh, we are also always trying to see it as not a, a singular event, but we want it to be an ongoing discussion. Um, the event, um, the campaign has reached uh, the uh, intended audience, uh, students of journalism, journalists themselves. And one of the key points that we, key stakeholders, as we call them, that we want to reach for the International Day to End Impunity are actually lawmakers, uh, judges, lawyers. Um, and those are some of the people that we consider as a key group in addressing uh, the issues of impunity of crimes against journalists. So we do take a very holistic approach and we try not to limit ourselves into one single event, uh, but try to have that conversation alive and ongoing. Oh, great. Uh, so what we're doing right now here in La Salle, Des Marias in Cavite is still part uh, of this campaign. Um, tell us, some, some um, students have actually sent questions for you to answer. They're asking mm -hmm. like one, um, how does UNESCO or the UN view how governments around the world can contribute to help keep journalists safe when they're working? That's an excellent question. And that is actually one of our important stakeholders as well. So UNESCO work, um, I just mentioned very holistically and comprehensively. It means working with the journalists themselves, working with uh, universities, working with civil society, NGOs, and working with the governments, policymakers, lawyer, judiciary, and um, including uh, security forces. So with governments, uh, UNESCO does one very important thing, which is every two years we issue a uh, UNESCO report on the and the danger of impunity. This is the only UN report that uh, is compiled based on the official information provided by each of the government's uh, countries where a journalist has been killed. Um, so we are asking, every year we ask, every year we ask each country where a journalist has been killed um, to tell us what is the status of the investigation of that, kill, of that killings. Um, the report first came out for the killings that started in 2006. And uh, between 2006 until 2016, we actually had um, 930 killings around the world. Yeah. So we want to make sure that impunity <coughs> doesn't happen by making sure that the government investigates the killings. Yes. Um, uh, an additional question for that is um, if, gov if you're asking government to investigate, how is the government of the Philippines, for example, uh, faring with this situation of investigating, especially that we're commemorating the Maguindanao massacre in a couple of days? 
Yeah, um, so Philippines has one of the highest rate of killings of journalists, and we all know that. In fact, um, it is ranked third in the world in the in 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 total number of killed journalists uh, between the years of 2006 and 2016. Um, I think as of today, there are as recorded by UNESCO. Uh, between two, from 2006 until now, 74 killings of journalists. Mm. And out of the 74 killings of journalists, only five cases has been resolved, um, which means there's a lot of cases that's either pending or we don't have any information on. And this include the Manginano uh, massacre that you just mentioned. So the investigations, uh, we wish that it would be faster, but one thing that the Philippines government, the Filipino government, has been very good at is to, to, to continue to update UNESCO on the status of the investigation. Um, we all wish that it would be a little bit faster and the perpetrators will be caught and you know, put away. But the reality is, at this current stage, only 5 out of 74 cases has been resolved. And many of these are still pending, and many of these are still um, with no information. Mm -hmm. With your uh, experience of traveling around the world and meeting journalists and, mm -hmm. and talking to news organizations and news companies, uh, what would you be uh, recommending to uh, news companies, for example, um, and news organizations? Uh, how can they protect their journalists when they're, uh, when they're doing news coverages? Um, it really depends on the type of journalism that the journalists are doing. Um, we have uh, we know that in the Philippines a lot of natural disasters happen. So in terms of natural disaster, there's one kind of uh, policy that you can have. Uh, in terms of journalists investigating on the criminal activities, corruption scandals, all of that, which carries itself a, a different set of dangers. Uh, those requires a different sets of uh, policies in place. But generally, uh, we encourage news organizations to have a uh, policy in place to improve the safety of journalists, whether it be um, training, uh, equipment, or in terms of investigation, perhaps digital, uh, digital skills, digital security skills, how to uh, make sure that your informations are better protected. Um, how to make sure that the uh, when you investigate, uh, you know, the money trail of certain cases, that you yourself are safe to begin with. Um, if you are travel, if you are uh, reporting on demonstrations, for example, or civil unrest, uh, we would like the uh, news organization to have trainings available for journalists uh, before they go and cover protests and uh, street violence and uh, and the likes. Uh, to have certain mindsets and skill sets so they will not get themselves in danger while covering the civil unrest and demonstrations. For uh, natural disasters, uh, perhaps some first aid skills are important. Uh, perhaps some uh, common sense training would be important. Clo from clothing, uh, the type of medications that you can bring, um, where to stand when you uh, re report on uh, the aftermath of a typhoon, for example. Those are very relevant uh, trainings and can be potentially life savings, but they are not always implemented. Mm. Um Going from that with news companies that can actually implement uh, these policies, how is uh, UNESCO and your office working with the academe or universities uh, in training their communication and media workers mm -hmm. or future mm -hmm. communication and media professionals in, who are going to the field of journalism? What about their safety? Uh, that's also a very important point, training future journalists. So to get the uh, uh, the mindset correct to, to, to start with, right? And then some of the background knowledge. And there is no better place to do that than the, the schools in the school system. Uh, we are now currently working uh, with the La Salle University to, uh, to create a, a curriculum for safety of journalists. And if created, uh, it will be the first one in the Philippines and in the region, basically. 
uh, UNESCO has uh, collaborated with universities uh, in other regions, namely from the Arab states region. Uh, it's a curriculum that is now being implemented in several universities in the Arab states region. And we would like to transfer that knowledge that we have gained from producing a curriculum in that region to the Asia Pacific region, but starting with the Philippines, because each country has its own uh, unique challenges. Um, so we try to s bring some of that to the Philippines. One very good example of each country having its unique challenges, the curriculum that we have developed and uh, implemented in the Arab states region does not have any training or a syllabus or section on how to cover flooding oh. because flooding is not a very big issue over there and it but is it a is a very big issue us. in the philippines yes it is no, no i can get it so there are specific unique instances of uh, news coverage work that journalists from the philippines will have to um, um, figure out what to do because the curriculum that's now uh, being used in the arab uh, countries does not exactly apply so we get that so we hope that um, uh, this new curriculum actually gets formulated uh, with CJT but in fact this um, month-long campaign of the department of the communication journalism department kicks off that intention to actually have um, a journalism safety education ingrained in the programs of the department and we have actually as an update already I, I, we sent you information it's already included in the curriculum that's being uh, presented now to the academic council and we're, we're pr pretty sure it's going to be there so the, the, the um, what do we do next now that we're interested so the students we have been telling them since the start of the communication impact campaign that there will be so journalism safety education in the curriculum for the next batch of students but um wh how would you know what would be the steps of unesco and la salle to actually make this happen so we include it in the curriculum so from here to the offering in um august next year um what should the, be the steps and what can we expect between unesco and la salle um, I would like to see some consultations uh, taking place. Um, so it's one side, it's one very important point to have the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the lecturers and the um, teachers giving their input. But at the same time, and to be absolutely beneficial for everybody involved, uh, I think we should also have the inputs from the news organizations uh, where eventually the journalism students will work. Um, and some of the practicing journalists who are very, uh, you know, experienced in this kind of thing, so they could also give some comments, and uh, perhaps some uh, policy makers at the uh, government uh, level, uh, so to see whether there's something more institutional get, that can be uh, implemented. Mm -hmm. So we really would like to see this uh, sharing of experience and expertise and input, and so that would be one very crucial step. And that by itself is a very important uh, uh, factor, and that by itself can be used as a, a teaching material. You know, the experiences of uh, established and uh, experienced journalists in, uh, in, uh, in safety issues. Mm -hmm. We have a forum uh, set up on November 23rd, and we're bringing back... Um, graduates of La Salle who are actually mm -hmm. in the journalism field now. One is a war correspondent, another one is a uh, conflict situation correspondent and also a news producer. So what, what we should do is actually you know, um, transcribe the, the forum input and uh, make this as a basis or part of the document for teaching material. That would be welcome, yes? That would be welcome, and I want to put a challenge out to uh, the students that have taken this uh, course on safety of journalists. When they do their internship or when they start their work uh, soon after graduation, um, to you know ask their editors what is the safety policy uh, of this news organization, because. Let's be frank. Some of the uh, you, you know, news organization doesn't put that as a priority, mm -hmm. and uh, I think is a is an important issue. And UNESCO certainly feels that because we are really working very hard, uh, working with different uh, stakeholders to try to uh, champion this and try to make sure that it is ingrained, as you have said, uh, in the mindset of. Uh, future journalists, but also practicing journalists. So perhaps it is a good moment. Uh, to, for the students 
venturing into their new career, whether it's the, with the start of the internship or in the first day of the job, to ask about, can I see the safety policy of this newsroom? Mm -hmm. If there's none, perhaps they can bring what they have learned, a semester-long course dedicated to safety, and help the news organization to develop a policy that can be used for other colleagues, you know. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll take note of that and echo your challenge to uh, to our students and, and, and the, the faculty and the department on and on on a weekly basis so we, it doesn't yep. get lost the message. Um, uh, something came up here. Um, the students were asking earlier, also sent a question, if we're having a safety education uh, course, you know, a semester long, what would actually be in it? Like uh, a student was asking, will they be actually put in simulated situations of like political harassment or covering a disaster? Is that part of the curriculum that's being taught in the Arab states, for example? Um, I think you can do uh, that, uh, even if it's not in the Arab state uh, curriculum. Uh, I think that is role playing is certainly something that is very beneficial. And in terms of uh, teaching pedag uh, pedagogical tools, uh, role playing has been shown to have a, a, a long lasting uh, impact. You know, people remember it. Uh, much better. So certainly, perhaps some role playing uh, in uh, difficult situations, and of course, uh, watching uh, certain uh, video clips of what has happened. And do not forget, nowadays there are three D uh, technology available. And one of the things that we always thought would be interesting to have is to have a training module that is using three D technology, which is getting more advanced uh, every year. So to really put the journalists or the trainees uh, or the students in this case into that virtual environment where they are surrounded by protests and they are surrounded by uh, flooding or they are surrounded by, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a war zone that they could uh, perhaps get that feeling uh, of reality there. Mm. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to that. And, and besides, will will be will the safety education uh, course also like be having um, journalists and maybe people from news organizations talking to students as part of the teaching? Is that yeah? Better? That is definitely um, an important part. You know, the knowledge sharing, uh, the networking, and that is already part of the uh, the curriculum that we are uh, using in uh, the Arab states. So definitely, I think that is one of those universal techniques that uh, can be employed in all the regions. All right. So um, thank you for that. Um, here's another question from the students. Uh, mm -hmm. We we checked off uh, what the government can do to keep journalists safe. Uh, news companies and, and uh, universities can do the same thing. What is the UNESCO expecting the public to do to help in the protection of uh, journalists? Because your November 2 campaign and as your discussions keep going about the safety of journalists and an end to impunity, um, the public is being reached with the campaign. So what do you expect from them? Well, the public should definitely, first of all, be aware of the situation. Do not not be aware of the situation. Um, in the end of the day, why we are doing all of this? You know, why are we fighting for the safety of journalists? Why are we fighting for uh, killings of journalists to be investigated? Why are we doing all this campaign? The ultimate goal of all of this is because of freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Because the press, a free, independent, quality good press is important for any democratic countries and that if it's gone the public the people everyone young old men women they'll all suffer because they will no longer be able to get quality information in which they can make the decisions of their lives to which impact themselves and also their families and their children so in the end of the day it is about providing information, quality information to the public and we know that the media, a free independent quality media is the best way to do that in a democracy and we really want the uh, the public to be aware of this um, and that is something that uh, we are fighting for and that is basically why we are doing work on safety of journalists because journalists plays an important role in ensuring a healthy democratic society functions. Well noted, uh, Dr. Ming. Uh, here's a question from a student. 
Um, do you think giving journalists uh, or keeping their press freedom on various media platforms actually increases the risks to them? Like uh, a journalist will be uh, on radio, television, print, and online because the, the, of the increasing media platforms, is the risks of danger increasing at the same time? Um, it's, there's no doubt that exposing uh, to multiple for, uh, media has multiple different sort of danger. Some more than others, some absence in others. So let's take the example of, you know, uh, really old style, old school uh, reporting, mm. uh, where you have to meet your sources uh, in the you know in the basement of a parking lot, uh, at a coffee shop, you know. So that is like the classic image of the journalist talking to the sources, right? That carries its own danger. And then moving on to nowadays, where you know sources can uh, send you information. Uh, you know, why, either via a public key, you know, secured uh, connections, even via, uh, uh, you know, through WhatsApp, Telegram, that sort of application, which is supposed to be quite secure, encrypted emails, all of that. That in itself also carries its danger. The danger of um, the uh, your information being hacked, mm -hmm. the information being uh, used by somebody who is even more technologically skilled than you. And which is why we do advocate as digital safety skills for journalists who are uh, using a lot of uh, electronic media, whether it's as simple as uh, protecting your vi uh, your email, uh, using stronger passwords, to all the way to using encryptions and uh, public safety keys and all of that. And the use of uh, social media, uh, it is... It, you, we have to realize that using social media exposes us to being uh, tracked. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you can track it with the metadata, track it with your uh, user information. So all of that can be tracked. And that is, again, yet another, um, another uh, safety concern that journalists should be aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, uh, there is uh, more extreme cases where uh, when a journalist travels to another country, his or her uh, electronics are confiscated by the uh, by the officers manning the the custom or border control. So those are yet another layer of uh, the issues that pertains to technology. Mm -hmm. um, should you think journalists have the right to refuse assignments that come with risks that they do not want to take, as you mentioned, no? I think every journalist uh, and every worker has the right to refuse an assignment. And when he or she refuses the assignment, uh, it should not uh, lead to a persecution. It should not be lead to harassment uh, or ridicule uh, from either the peer or the, uh, the news organization hiring uh, the person. So I think... Uh, Universal labor uh, principle, labor union principle applies as well. If the worker, in this case, the journalists themselves feel uncomfortable, unsafe to perform a certain task that has been assigned to them, they have and should have the right to uh, say no. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here. Um, should journalists prioritize work? or their media coverage over their own safety when they're covering times of crisis. I think uh, this has to do with, um, you know, the often uh, repeated adage that no story is worth dying for. Like, should journalists yeah. be thinking when they come upon the scene? Like, the compact theme this year is about uh, the rational says, the journalists are usually mm. the first people on the scene in times of crisis because they're there to cover the event. Um, however... Should they you know, keep doing the work when the reality is they may be harmed? Are they journalists first or are they you know, humans first who need to save themselves? I agree on your point that no news is worth your life. If you are dead, you can't tell the news. Mm -hmm. So as simple as that is a, is a logical uh, question. But when you are there, right in the middle of the action, you sometimes uh, forget or sometimes you feel that if I go that just approach that target a little bit closer, I will get a better photo, get a better audio. I probably can interview that person. But going that further will probably put you in a little bit more danger. 
or even a lot more danger. So you really have to uh, assess whether um, it's worth it. Uh, there are other approaches to take a news. For example, we talked about uh, demonstrations just now. We talked about a uh, natural disaster. Is it really worth standing in the middle of a war zone? Mm -hmm. Is it really worth standing in the middle of the aftermath of a typhoon where the river is still flooded to have a really good uh, report? Or is it good to have just step 10, 10 meters back, 20 meters back, and take the overview of the situation. So the journalist has to decide with his or her common sense and intuitions and expertise and experience on what is best. But back to what you have said just now, no story is worth your life. If you are dead, you can't tell the story or the next story. That's right. Um there's a question here. <laughs> mm -hmm. How we shall we answer? You have time for like a couple more questions, Dr. Me? Sure. I know you're Go very ahead. busy over there. Um, the question goes, uh, how can journalism thrive when journalists are being attacked for exposing abuses and corruption? Exactly what you were saying. Uh, is journalism thriving in like other countries around the world where, where corruption and, and, uh, are be is being covered and you know, journalists get you know, harassed or killed off for doing so? I think the old adage uh, that says uh, if your journalism report or your reportage doesn't offend someone, then you are not doing journalism, you are doing PR. <laughs> so, uh, or propaganda, uh, depending on your point of view. Uh, I think it's very important to note that the journalists who are being attacked, uh, being killed uh, for their serious investigation into criminal activities, mafia, uh, corruption, scandal, and all of that, it's because they hit a nerve. They are doing something so important, so uh, useful to the rest of the public, that they are being targeted by a minority group. And let's be very clear, they are still a minority a minority group of criminal uh, affiliated uh, people that will want them to not say anything about it. So that is something that keep in mind um, that it is because what the journalist is doing is important that they are being targeted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, mm. yeah, so that is something that uh, we really need to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, we, there are so many questions here, but yeah, I'll, I'll just give... Uh, time for this one more because we talked about it when you were here in the Philippines in September. Uh, the question is, how can journalists keep themselves safe online? You already mentioned encrypting your email. Uh, but um, student journalists, more particularly, our students right now, are, you know, they're here use, doing their coverage uh, with their television equipment, their radio equipment, and even their online platforms right now with us. Um, how can these student journalists keep themselves safe right now that they're doing their online journalism. We're on FB Live, okay. by the way, 959 Green FM, and we're there. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, it's, um, resources are getting uh, more readily available. Um, I mentioned some uh, really difficult ones. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't use the word difficult because it's getting more and more easy to use and uh, you take 30 minutes to learn and you can do it. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to send encrypted information, uh, you know, a story that you don't want to share to other people for whatever reason, safety reason, or you don't want other people to get a scoop, uh, try uh, encryption. They are readily available. Email encryption is available. You can try pretty good privacy. Uh, PGP, uh, which is uh, open, uh, you know, the public key, private key system. So you, only people that has your key can open the message that has been uh, received. Um, you can uh, practice uh, what they call a good uh, online hygiene, which is to always make sure that you have the uh, latest uh, Web browsers available. Uh, uh, have, Does it really uh, matter if you have the latest you know, yeah, web all of browser? That. Yeah. It really matters if you have the latest like web browser updated apps. It really matters. Yes, it actually does because uh, let's be uh, honest. Not 
all the all the best applications out there, whatever they say that is you know the most foolproof, the 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 best secured system out there, will one day be able to be hacked by somebody mm. smarter than the person who created yeah. the uh, anti-hacked. Yeah. Um, so we just have to be constantly updated by it. It's a bit of a work uh, to be to be sure uh, to be constantly updating it. But again, luckily things are getting a little bit more easy. Just don't forget to update your browsers. Don't forget to update your applications from time to time. Um, don't open a suspicious email. People still do that. <laughs> Uh, so these are all part of what we call practicing, uh, you know, internet hygiene. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very yeah. much. I know our millennial audience will appreciate that everything you're saying. But uh, uh, at this point, Doctor Ming, so we won't uh, take much more of your time. Um, do you have something to share or advocate or announce from your end that uh, we should be watching out for or helping you with in this campaign to keep the press free and uh, keep our journalists safe? Mm. Uh, well, the uh, campaign will culminate in a uh, event that will be organized in Colombo, Sri Lanka, on the fourth of December. So perhaps you could also visit uh, UNESCO's website to learn more about what we are trying to do there uh, in Colombo, Sri Lanka, by gathering all these uh, judges, lawyers, uh, human rights commission, national human rights commissions, trying to get them there to really get this collective going on to, to, to make an impact on ensuring that we first of all, we try to avoid all journalists being killed. Mm -hmm. But if a journalist is indeed killed or attacked, then the investigation should be speedily done, thoroughly done, and the perpetrator put through the, the court of law and uh, have to face justice. To, in order to prevent other perpetrators from thinking that it's okay to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. No uh, repercussion will come from that. We have to cut that out from the mindset of anybody who wishes to do harm to, um, to journalists to make sure that they know, all the bad guys out there, they know that if uh, the journalist is killed, that the investigation will be swift, it will be thorough, and you will not feed into the vicious cycle of impunity. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, we'd like to emphasize that no journalist should be attacked for a story they're actually delivering. Thank you Don't very kill much. the messenger. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Ming Kok Lim, live from Jakarta, Indonesia. He's the advisor for the UNESCO Communication and Media Department. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. And until we meet again in the Philippines. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Okay. And that was uh, all today for today on Media Watch. Tune in again next Tuesday as we deliver the news about media and communication technology. Only here on 95.9 Green FM. Please continue to connect with us on 959 Green FM on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For a recap of today's show, please visit our website, 959greenfm.wordpress.com, 959 Green FM on YouTube, Animal Channel, YouTube. Please, we give our thanks to our executive producers and Catherine Lepardo, producer Joshua Roldan, associate producer Wendell de Guzman. Thanks to our writers, reporters, and technical team. Thanks to our Green FM News Department, Green FM Operations, and Green FM Promotions. Thank you, our audience, for tuning in and spending your time with us. I am Angie Quadrabalibai, and this has been Media Watch, delivering the news on media and communication technology. Only here on 95.9 Green FM, dahil basta balita. Dito ka. Thank you.